Welcome everyone to our weekly Q&A session with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. Of course, thanks for having me. Absolutely. My name is Dilshad Berman. I'm a writer and reporter with City and 680 News, and I will be moderating this chat today. Now, the way it goes, if you haven't been watching all these, all these months that we've been doing this, is we collect questions over the past week for the doctor and present them to her today. She's never seen them before. All the ans answers are off the cuff. And if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so in the live chat alongside this broadcast. And we'll try to take as many as we can in this short 30 minute period that we have with the doctor. So doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our vaccine questions. There's a ton of them that come in every week and they're top of mind for a lot of people. So we'll start with those and then we move on to non-vaccine related questions. So today we're going to start with Pearl and Karen, who have very similar questions. Um, so essentially, they're asking, why isn't anyone talking about treatment for COVID-19? We went straight to vaccines, which don't seem to be as efficient. Um, so why aren't we um, investing more funds in finding a treatment? Well, actually, we've been, that's all we had, actually, originally were treatments um, for COVID-19 vaccine. And certainly, there is ongoing research for the treatments. Uh, I'm a public health doctor, so I actually prefer to prevent an illness rather than to treat it. So that is um, my philosophy of medicine, if, if you will. And so uh, it's not that we're saying don't focus on the treatments. Treatment information is ongoing. There are treatments available, uh, not always, uh, you know, uh, going to be good for every person. Some people still get very sick and have side effects from the infection itself. And so the point of the vaccine is not only to prevent the infection for the person, but also from a societal level. If mm -hmm. we just let people get sick and are treated, they have to actually see someone, a healthcare provider, a physician, in order to get that treatment. And we actually don't have that much healthcare capacity to be able to, to, have, uh, to have that in place as well. Right, right, absolutely. Um, okay, let's take a live question that's coming in right now from Candace S. Um, she asks, so far, uh, the World Health Organization has approved the mixing of vaccines for AstraZeneca and Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Moderna. Do you know if Health Canada is working with who to get their approval for mixing Pfizer and Moderna? Okay, so I think the WHO clearly states that it's up to each of the local jurisdictions, you know, like Canada, to come up with recommendations for their uh, country, for their residents, based on the supply, really, or the circumstances where they're at. Um, and so absolutely, the conversations are ongoing, as I understand it, uh, between the World Health Organization, federally, um, to recognize the mis mixed schedules that Canadians have sure. because of the good advice of the, the committees and the scientists in Canada. So that work is absolutely ongoing. Right, because a lot of us have actually gotten the Pfizer and Moderna mix for sure, because recently we had no Pfizer, we only had Moderna. And again, like you said, based on supply, we've had to mix those vaccines. That's right. That's right. Um, okay, and then Anthony asks, when we see vaccination status unknown in the daily case counts, can you clarify what that means? Okay, so unknown means that there's no record for vaccination in our provincial vaccine registry. And so it's very, very likely that they were not vaccinated in Ontario. There are some people who may have chosen not to have their information recorded in the vaccine registry. Okay. That number is quite small. So it either means that they got a vaccine abroad and it hasn't been recorded or identified, or more likely that they are unvaccinated. Okay, okay. Um, and next up, Mr. Inquisitive asks, why are vaccinated people exempt from regular testing when they can also be asymptomatic carriers of the virus? So vaccinated people are recommended for testing just like unvaccinated people. Unvaccinated people are not recommended for asymptomatic um, uh, testing in general. I know that there are some recommendations for rapid testing for people who are asymptomatic who have not been vaccinated. And that, again, is a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. But if you have symptoms of COVID and you are vaccinated, 
or if you were a close contact of someone who had COVID, uh, public health will make recommendations for you to go to go and get tested and to get that gold standard test, the PCR test. Th that's even if you are vaccinated and you've been exposed, you still be recommended to get a test? Absolutely, yes. And we certainly do want to encourage people who are vaccinated to go and get that test. And this is, again, what we're trying to do is to say, if you're vaccinated and you've been identified as having had contact, so the chances of you getting COVID are higher than just anyone walking around uh, in the neighborhood, hmm. that, those are the people that we want to make sure that we get tested. Right, okay. Um, okay, let's move on to Tanya's question. Tanya asks, now that our 12-year-old grandkids are back at school, how do vaccinated grandparents with no pre-existing conditions visit unvaccinated grandchildren and vaccinated parents? That is, is it the same protocols as before? Can we be unmasked with the parents, but we have to mask with the grandkids? Is it safe to spend the weekends away at the cottage together? These are all really good questions, actually. Um, and I think a lot of it is going to depend on your individual circumstances. So if you are a grandparent who has a health condition that puts you at very high risk of getting COVID, well, you may want to add an additional layer, meaning wearing a mask and keeping a physical distance, outdoor visits only with your grandkids uh, because of the higher risk that you have. Uh, you certainly want, want to make sure that when you're around uh, children, even adults that you're visiting, that no one has symptoms. If anyone has symptoms, have them get tested. You don't want to take that risk either. Um, and, you know, there is no question that you have to really identify for yourself uh, what your risks are. If someone in the classroom has had an exposure and now one of the grandkids is at home isolating, well, certainly you can't visit them then. Hmm. What about the others in the household? Don't, they are not recommended to go and visit um, people who are vulnerable as well because someone is isolating at home. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then we've got a question from uh, Twitter from Bobby. Um, she asks, how do they know that breakthrough cases are less severe? People apparently have a wide range of symptoms from asymptomatic to death. What is the metric for determining that if not for the vaccine, things would have been worse? Well, you can actually look at the rates of hospitalization among vaccinated and unvaccinated. So that's one very common metric that we have. And we see that those who are hospitalized are 40 plus times more likely uh, to, to, to be unvaccinated uh, mm -hmm. and get COVID. Um, so that's one. We do know from our case investigations that people who are vaccinated and get COVID tend to have milder symptoms. That has been reported uh, as well. Okay, okay. Um, okay, let's move on to Patricia's question, because this is something that has come up very often after the uh, vaccines were introduced. Uh, Patricia asks, how long is the disruption of menstruation expected to last after the vaccine shots? So the vaccine is not associated with disruption of menstruation. Uh, people have... Um, been following this very closely to ensure that the vaccine is not related to fertility issues, to menstruation. What we do know is that menstrual irregularities can be quite common, maybe even one in six women who will have them. And so there is no link between the vaccine and menstrual disruption. It is something though that, that we are watching closely to ensure that there is no link there. Right, okay. Um, and then, Okay, this is from Anonymous. Um, does the immunity provided by the vaccine last longer than natural immunity after an infection? It seems to be the case, yes. That is, uh, we know that uh, natural immunity, we can't guarantee how strong your natural immunity is going to be. Mm -hmm. We know with coronaviruses, like cold viruses, you can get uh, another infection. You can get two colds in one year. Right. And so we say that the natural immunity lasts for at least 90 days. And right now, the um, immunity from uh, being fully vaccinated, uh, if you are, especially are healthy uh, and are fully vaccinated, your immunity is lasting much longer than that. Okay, okay. Um, let's go on to some live questions here. Um, I can't pronounce this person's full name, but I'll say arm C fadful. <laughs> um, if vaccinated people are less likely to show symptoms, why are we allowing them to gather and spread it to everybody around them? 
Okay, so we still are in, you know, our, our fourth wave of infection uh, uh, of the virus. And so we still need to take some precautions, even if we're vaccinated. That is absolutely correct. And so we still want to limit our indoor gatherings, especially large indoor gatherings. We still, if we're vaccinated, say that outdoors is, is better. But there's no question that if you're unvaccinated, we know that you're seven times more likely to get COVID. Mm -hmm. And so again, that risk dramatically drops uh, among those who are vaccinated. But even among the vaccinated, if you have symptoms, you should not be attending work or school or, or gatherings uh, right. as well. Right, absolutely. Um, and there's a question coming in from uh, Candice on YouTube, but she says, kid question from Zoe. So I'm assuming this is a question from a child. Um, can COVID spread to and from pets? And are pets able to get a vaccine of some sort? So humans can actually give uh, COVID to, to pets. Uh, there have actually been uh, dog COVID in Ontario. Right. Um, we know cats have gotten COVID, big cats even, lions and tigers right. uh, at zoos, for example. So, and it's uh, expected that they are getting it from humans, uh, but it's not clear whether they can spread COVID back to, to humans. Okay. And, and so I think the bottom, the bottom line, what we recommend is if you're sick, if you have symptoms, take precautions, even for your pets as well. Right, right. And there's, I mean, not that we would know this, but there's no pet vaccine yet in terms of COVID. That's right. I have not, I'm not a veterinarian, right. but I have not heard of a vaccine for COVID-19 for pets yet. Okay. Um, and then let's take a live question coming in from our website here. Sean asks, COVID is supposed to become endemic. What will things be like at that stage? Will we still be living like today or will we treat it like the flu where we will accept some amount of risk in, in order to live our normal lives? That's exactly right, actually, that when COVID becomes endemic, we will expect to see a seasonality to it, for example, uh, that it will, we know it will come, we will prepare ourselves, um, but we will have the healthcare capacity to deal with the infections as they occur. And what's different now, why we say we're still in the pandemic is because if we don't have these controls in place, we will have a lot of COVID that will overwhelm our healthcare system. We're not at that stage where um, we can, where the endemic COVID is actually able to be controlled enough right. uh, without these uh, additional controls. Right. Um, let's go back to our submitted questions. Christine asks, do vaccinated people who get COVID get the long hauler syndrome? That uh, is not clear. Uh, it's not, there still is not enough research out there to be able to prove yes or no. Um, we do know, I mean, if you get a milder COVID, you're not likely to get more severe symptoms in a long COVID if you develop long COVID. Uh, but that, uh, I don't have a direct answer for you right now, except to say that that's something under real active scientific uh, investigation. Right, right. Um, and, and as you've said, I mean, if you prevent yourself from getting COVID, then you don't get long COVID. So that's the bottom line. Yeah. And yeah. And if you're vaccinated and you get COVID and you get a milder case of COVID, again, if you get long COVID, I would imagine that the long COVID that you get are milder symptoms compared yeah. to, um, you know, if you had a more severe case of COVID. Right. But I don't have, I don't, I, I, we're still looking into that. Yeah. Right. Understood. Okay. Um, and then let's go to Sheila's question. Sheila asks, can a group of people who are all double vaccinated gather for dinner without masks and social distancing? Well, actually the answer is yes, because you can go to a restaurant, right? I mean, in a restaurant, you can sit at a table with people that you don't live with and you take your masks off and you're in an indoor setting. And so I think, um, of course, being a group of vaccinated people lowers the risk. I would take it outdoors, go to the patio that will again lower the risk further and make sure that you tell the people that you're going with. If you have symptoms, please don't come. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and then Jay asks, in your opinion, will COVID-19 booster shots become a yearly requirement? Do you think it's possible that it will be even more frequent than once a year? 
So this is under active scientific investigation as well, too. I don't have an answer for you. I think the data is continuing to come in to tell us how long does the immunity last? Will the virus change? Um, will What about hospitalizations and deaths being protected from them for the vaccine compared to preventing infection? These are all the questions that actually we're, we're looking at. Um, and hopefully in the coming days, weeks, months, we will have more, more clear answers on this. Right. And then this is not something I'm familiar with. So let's ask this question. Jeff asks, why does the vaccine target ACE2 protein when it is used for inflammation and clotting? Uh, the vaccine, uh, as far as I know, does not uh, target uh, that. The vaccine actually uh, is against the spike protein. Hmm. So um, the way the vaccines work is that actually it's to develop antibodies against the spike protein, which is the protein on the surface of the virus. Uh, and that's how you develop immunity. And so if you're infected, the spike protein is what attacks the cells and you have immunity against that. And so your body fights against the virus. So you don't actually um, get, get the infection or get a bad infection most of the time. Right, okay. Um, okay, w Wayne has an interesting question. I'm assuming they dropped this question in last night. So they say tonight at a dinner at uh, our party was surprised to learn that our server was not vaccinated. He was within two meters distance and he was wearing his mask below his nose while he was serving us and it made us very uncomfortable. So if restaurants don't have a policy that all their staff has to be vaccinated against the virus, is it possible for public health to mandate that, that they at least post a sign outside the restaurant stating that all of their staff are not vaccinated so that people have a chance to assess their own risk before you know, entering the restaurant? It's a really good question. Uh, Ontario's vaccine certification process, which is supposed to be coming in in uh, you know days, really, is uh, as I understand it directed to customers. Though I haven't seen the regulations yet. Uh, workplaces, though, are recommended to have a workplace vaccination policy for their staff. And so, at Toronto Public Health, we have made a recommendation to workplaces to have a vaccination policy for their staff. It is a recommendation um, right now, and um, I would absolutely urge all workplaces to to have those policies. And I think when you are booking, uh, you know, a reservation at a restaurant, you could ask the restaurant, "Do you have a vaccination policy for your staff?" Right, right, absolutely, right. Um, and then let's go to a concerned Canadian. Okay, actually, we've we've come to the end of our vaccine questions, so we're going to go into um, non-vaccine related questions. Concerned Canadian asks: um, Are all the Afghanistan refugees tested for COVID before they enter Canada, and are they quarantined? I think this is more of a federal question, but doctor, if you might have some insight. Well, we know that uh, I, I don't I don't know specifically what the protocols are for the Afghan refugees, but I do know that when you travel internationally, there are testing requirements, mm -hmm. and um, it would be the same for this group who would be required to maintain those testing requirements when they enter Canada. Right, right. Uh, and let's grab this live question coming in on our website. Ha Happiness asks, who is catching the Delta variant? Where are they catching it, and are they wearing masks? Okay, well, the Delta variant in Toronto and even in Ontario is, is the cause for most COVID cases. Uh, in Toronto, probably 90% of our cases are because of the Delta variant. We know that it, it spreads more easily. It depends on who you are in terms of how you're getting it. We know for children, they're often getting it in the home. Mm -hmm. Someone at home has it and is spreading it to them. That's the commonest way that they're getting it. We know even beyond children, though, people identify that they have someone in their house or a close contact who, who um, had COVID and that's how they're getting it. And then the community is the other way that people are often saying that they're getting COVID. And so this is, you know, you're out and about, you're going to a restaurant. We've heard from our viewers here, right? Going to a restaurant, yeah. uh, going to this place or that place, can't always pinpoint exactly where you got COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more interactions you have with others, that is how COVID can spread. And then the last category is travel. Travel is still um, a predominant way that people are, are getting COVID as well. Okay, okay. Um, okay, John asks, 
here in Canada, and I'm sure elsewhere, all you get is go home, and if it gets worse, come back, and hopefully we will save you, or you can die alone. Um, all efforts are on lockdowns, masks, social distancing, and vaccination, but nothing on how to treat yourself. Why is that? If you get COVID, what can you do to help yourself to recover? Yeah, good question. We actually have uh, some guidance on our Toronto Public Health website on what to do if you have COVID. Uh, the guidance really is to, first of all, seek medical attention if you need it. Please do not hesitate. Like call 911 if you need to, go to the emergency department, call your family doctor if you uh, need medical attention. You want to make sure that you stay hydrated. I mean, this is the case for all infections. Dehydration can be a very big problem. So you have to drink plenty of fluids. If you're vomiting and can't keep things down, that probably means you either need medications or need to seek medical help. Uh, rest, we know, is really important. You also want to take precautions in your home so that COVID doesn't spread to others. But you also want to keep a close eye, have someone keep a close eye on you um, to check in with you to make sure that you are doing okay. And if you need medical attention, please do seek uh, medical attention. You can take over the counter medications as well. For example, if you have a fever or your muscles are aching, um, but if you're not sure, consult with your, your doctor or nurse practitioner or the emergency department. Okay, okay. Um, let's go to a live question here. Uh, is Canada going to mandate vaccines and how do you think the government will enforce that mandate? Okay, it's hard to, I mean, it's a very big question, mandate vaccines, what exactly does that mean? We've seen different levels of government and different organizations have vaccine requirements. Um, I like to use the word vaccine requirements. Mandating vaccines to me makes it sound like someone will give you a vaccine against your consent and that will not happen. You will always have to consent to receive vaccinations. And so we've seen workplaces have vaccination policies in schools now, teachers and staff working in schools have vaccination policies long-term care in hospitals for example and then with the vaccine certification in order to go to certain places you need to be vaccinated right. at the federal level to travel so there are certainly uh, requirements for vaccination that are in place these are all vaccine requirements right right absolutely um but i think that the fear that a lot of people have is is exactly like you said they'll probably be forced to do it without their consent but that has we've never done that for any vaccines throughout Canada, right? In order to get the vaccine, the healthcare provider who's giving you the vaccine needs informed consent. And so I think what you will find though, is that if you're unvaccinated, maybe your choices of what you can do or can't do um, might change, right. but that doesn't mean that uh, someone will give you a vaccine against your consent. Right, right. Um, okay, let's jump back into our submitted questions. Um, Claire asks, do we have numbers for children under 12 who are hospitalized? And does Toronto Public Health have the power to advise schools to close if the province doesn't announce a full lockdown? Okay, so yes, there is information on um, cases in children and um, severe cases in children. Uh, right now, there are no uh, hospitalizations in Toronto um, uh, as a Friday that I was aware of uh, related to COVID-19. So that was good news. It's certainly something that we're keeping a close eye on, especially understanding what's going on in other parts of the world. Uh, Toronto Public Health certainly does provide guidance to schools on um, dismissing cohorts, for example, uh, closing schools sometimes. Uh, based on uh, COVID activity as well. Right, but would TPH possibly have um, sort of jurisdiction to say, you know, we're telling all schools to close down whether or not the province is actually in lockdown? So in April of this year, Toronto Public Health, our medical officer of health issued a section 22 order um, to close schools. Uh, and it was done a week before the province closed all schools. So again, that though ha has to be based on the evidence that, you know, COVID is spreading. The, the rate, it can't just be just because it's certainly based on a thorough uh, investigation and assessment of the situation uh, in our community, in our schools, and based on the public health risk. Right, okay. Um, and let's take this uh, live question coming in from Calvin. Um, 
he asks, does Dr. Gabay know if any public health units or Ontario facilities are looking into capturing the numbers or impact of long haul COVID syndrome? Okay, good question. So right now, long haul COVID is not reportable. Like that is the mechanism that we use to be able to, because um, we don't see patients. Public health does not see patients directly. It's uh, the, you know, the clinicians who then report to public health and long COVID is not a reportable illness. Uh, you know, so, um, but I think that this is a really good question. How can we understand what the rates of long COVID are? And so there are uh, clinics in the city that are um, assessing this and there is research being done internationally as well to try and understand what the rates are. It's, um, it, but it is, it is uh, something that, you know, is being kind of looked at and, uh, investigated and figuring out how to report on it um, on an international scale. Right. Even deciding what to call it, you know, like right. uh, there have been conversations on that as well. Right. But specifically in Ontario, we're, we're not looking into it. Is it more of an international study thing? I'm not aware of reporting on long COVID in Ontario. And so, um, but I can certainly follow up and if there's anything that I find report back. Awesome, great, okay. Um, and let's do another uh, question from our cash. Gregory asks, is it possible that COVID could still remain in the body after six months and then be reactivated, say if you caught, caught a flu bug? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we see that with some viruses that, uh, you know, with chickenpox, for example, you have your chickenpox, the virus, some of it can stay dormant in what we call the dorsal ganglion, so in your in your nerves, and then years later can come out as shingles. Um, I have not seen reports of that related to COVID-19. It is a very new infection, though, and so we do recognize that we need to very, keep a very close eye on this virus to see yes. if that is um, something that could be possible down the line. Right. I think so far, when we were, we've been ta we've been talking all these months, doctor, we've said that you can catch COVID again, which is like a fresh infection, but we're not quite sure if it's the old infection that got reactivated. Well, we do know that the cases of reinfection are a different strain. Yeah. And so we know then that it's not a reactivation. It is a different strain uh, in those cases, um, for okay. sure. Okay. Um, let's see, do we have a live question? No, we'll go back to our submitted questions here. Um, Anthony asks, can you please tell us about the scientific studies around hydrochloroquine as it relates to COVID-19? Well, I mean, th there's lots to say about scientific studies, right? I mean, we our best scientific study is the randomized control trial, then there are cohort trials and case control studies. I mean, there are lots of different ways in which to study uh, medicine. And when you look at the evidence, you're not looking at one particular study either. You're looking at the body of, you know, all of the studies combined. Are they showing a consistent um, direction for positive or negative? And so, again, that is hydrochloroquine is not a, is not used as a treatment for um, for COVID right now. But if the studies you know, that are ongoing show that there is a benefit from it, then it is something that could be considered um, in the future. Okay. Um, and Mick Figgy asks, why do you think that some school boards didn't put children into cohorts this year? My daughter's school of 300 plus kids is overcrowded and doesn't allow for any social distancing. Okay, so the concept of a cohort is actually that uh, the child is in a classroom. That might be another way to say it is the classroom is considered the cohort in most cases. And so the child, mo most students are part of the classroom cohort. Mm -hmm. If you go to before or after school care, you might be in a before or after school cohort. If you're on a bus, you might be part of a bus cohort. So each student can be part of more than one cohort. But the idea here with the cohort is to be able to know which children are interacting with which other children. Right. And so if someone in the cohort, whether it's on the bus or in the classroom, gets COVID, is at school and they're contagious, you know who could have had close contact without having to interview all of the students who are in the class. You just assume that they all may have had close contact and you dismiss the whole cohort. So um, 
And the idea behind the cohort is that you recognize that it's not always possible to keep a physical distance at all times. Right. So, for example, if you're on a school bus, there's more students going to school this year. It may not be possible to keep a physical distance at all times. And so we identify the bus cohort, for example. Right. Okay. Um, and then Guy asks, uh, Dr. Dubey, do you know if we are headed into another lockdown? Do you think we're headed into another lockdown? Uh, I, I have to say, I, I can't predict the future. Um, my hope is just like the rest of you that COVID uh, stays uh, under control, is under control, so we do not need a lockdown. I can certainly tell you that vaccines are our one difference this time around, and our are really our hope uh, against a lockdown. And so, you know, each additional percent that our vaccination rates increase, that will help to prevent um, the spread of COVID, which will help to prevent a future lockdown for sure. Right, absolutely. And we just have one minute left, so I'm gonna squeeze in this last question. Um, Tiffany asks, why do we have higher case numbers than we did last year? Uh, uh, okay, so um, our case numbers are looking at all cases. And I think we recognize that with the Delta variant, it spreads more easily. And so you can expect that you might get more cases of COVID, but we know in the vaccinated, it is a milder infection. And so that's why we're actually looking less at the total case numbers. The case numbers tell us how much COVID we have and how much actually could have been spread to others. But what we actually want to look at um, in particular for this fourth wave is hospitalizations, deaths, those severe illnesses, and especially um, what impact that is having on our healthcare system. Right, okay, and that brings us to one o'clock. Thank you so much, doctor, once again, for joining us this week. If we didn't get to your live questions, I apologize, but we will have the doctor back with us next week, and so we'll try to get to them then. For now, we'll sign off. Thanks again, doctor. Okay, thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.